I, I can't say uh, uh, what an honor it is to be here. Uh, there are many people in this room who have had a, a, a profound influence on my thought over the years. Uh, people like uh, Vira Mea, uh, like Seth Kunin, who's sitting over there, but nobody more so than uh, these two up here on the, on the platform. Uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, Anita remembers that uh, she invited me to speak at, at USP. You invited me to speak at USP, at the University of Sao Paulo, 41 years ago, <laughs> back when we were both even younger than we are today, <laughs> on, the, on the ideology of Cervantes. Years ago, 41 years ago, Sao Paulo University. Yeah. <laughs> You made a real impression on me, more than I made on you, obviously. That's, that's a Jewish memory. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the time that I spent with Natan in, uh, in Paris, likewise. Since uh, my uh, talk today has to do with the genealogy and the Inquisition, I think it's only appropriate that I start by making a public confession. That's what one does when one is called to the Inquisition. I am a Jew. Uh, I am a Jew by three of the five ways in which Jews are often uh, described or characterized. Uh, although, as Professor uh, Della Pergola and others have pointed out, that trying to define Judaism is a, a very, very complex uh, matter indeed. Uh, first of all, by biology. I have a Jewish mother and I have two Jewish grandmothers. I can't go much, much back further than that, but that's enough to make me a member of the tribal community of Judaism. The second is by beliefs. Uh, uh, there is a traditional core of uh, Jewish belief, but as a non-believer, as I am, I really can't claim to be Jewish by that criterion. The third is by practice, that is the repetition or the, the adherence to the halachic uh, uh, law, but uh, I don't practice. Uh, I do observe some of the Jewish holidays with my children, uh, but really as a kind of a memory touch, touchstone, uh, as a, uh, a way of uh, thinking about ourselves. Uh, but I'm not an observant Jew, so I can't, I can't claim to be Jewish by that criterion either. The fourth might be by self-concept. I clearly think of myself as a Jew, so I guess I am. And the fourth, of course, is the, a, 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 the fifth is a definition by an external uh, definer, that is, uh, by others. There, people see me as a Jew, uh, and that has had consequences in my life, uh, many of them positive, but not all of them. Uh, as uh, that the, ex the external definition of Judaism has had uh, positive and negative consequences throughout history, say in the Iberian dominions during the 16th and the 17th centuries. Now, the Inquisition trial uh, dossiers, which are called procesos, are useful for genealogical study in two ways. The first is for tracing families, since the accused persons had to provide data about their relationships. And the second is for understanding these ancestral families in the context of some of those five ways of defining Jews, by their biology, their beliefs, their practices, their attitudes toward their Jewishness, and what other people think about them as Jews. The clues also uh, give, the, the do documents also give us clues about the conversos relationships to the majority Catholic communities of which they formed a part, to their commitment and uh, uh, their uh, decision, if any, to transmit their Jewishness to the next generation. Sometimes it even gives us clues as to their motivations. The, uh, early, the families of these early conversos uh, profiled in the Mexican Inquisition archives are the converts and their children and their grandchildren. And they are, of course, the main source of the Jewishness of the people who identify themselves today as remnant crypto-Jews. Many of these early, uh, and I use the term converso because converso is a good catch-all uh, term, uh, term. It means someone who has converted 
and their children and their grandchildren and for many, many generations. Now, some of these early converso immigrants were anusim, that is, Jews who were co coerced to become Christian. And many others converted for a number of very human re reasons, including sometimes a very sincere belief in the tenets of uh, Catholicism as preached to them by the converting friars. Uh, to represent all of them as forced converts, as anusim, or as uh, perhaps uh, uh, the, the destroyed one, that despicable term, the mishumadim, of those who are to be read out of the community, is to oversimplify uh, a very, very complex world and may not be as appropriate as, as it is come to be used today. The sets of practices and beliefs and the attitudes of these founding Mexican converso families launched the long genealogical chain to which people who identify themselves today as remnants of those conversos uh, uh, belong. These early settlers were not the only source of the modern uh, community's Jewish identity, since as with any culture, with transmittal over some time, some things are lost and some are changed and some are enriched by accretions from other sources. Now, I work in, the, in, in recent years in the early Inquisition documents from Spain, Mexico, and Portugal. And while there are some differences in those documents, uh, there are enough similarities in them to make what I'm about to say uh, pretty much valid for any of them. I'm going to talk about two extended multi-generational families. And they are the children and grandchildren of Gabriel de Fonseca Castellanos, who came to Mexico in 1534, and I believe is the earliest crypto-Jew in Mexico whose religious practices and beliefs that we know a good deal about and the children and grandchildren of Antonio Hernández de Almeida, who came to Mexico in 1571. These two are typical of the founding families of North American crypto-Judaism, in that in their origin, the families were Castilian, they are not Aragonese or Catalan. They're from families who rather than convert in 1492, chose exile, and most of them went to Portugal. The choices that these people made and the consequences of those choices over time are crucial to us understanding their history and by, by uh, extension, modern families' histories. The Great Expulsion of 1492, we must never forget, was a kind of sorting device. The device compelled people to make choices. And to some extent, those Spanish Jews whose, uh, uh, with married children living down the block, with very valuable property, with a good job, with fear of change and fear of uprooting, uh, many of those people tended to convert, thinking that things might get better or they could always leave later or a number of things. But the people whose number one commitment was to their Jewish identity tended to leave. Uh, and that difference, that choice, accounts for many of the differences between Portuguese and Spanish crypto-Jews. The Jews from Western Castile almost all went to Portugal. Uh, Lorenzo, uh, the genealogical data in these documents together with the stories of their lives as woven through the documents relevant to their cases tell us not only who they were and their names, but how they were and how and if they transmitted how they were to their children. Lorenzo and Blanca, the converting generation, lived in a Spanish village on the Portuguese border. Lorenzo was employed as a minor noble, uh, by a minor noble as an administrator of his estates. When the expulsion order came in 1492, their two children, Gabriel de Castellanos and Lorenzo Alvarez, were still very young. The senior Lorenzo, an observant Jew forced to choose, chose to leave his job, to remain Jewish, and to, remove, and to move his family to Portugal, where they were forced to convert. Uh, the second generation, Gabriel de Castellanos, 
then a second generation converso, married Felipe de Fonseca, who was another second generation, and they produced four th third generation converso children, Isabel, Lope, Guillomar, and Tomas, the youngest. Felipe died giving birth to Tomas. All four children took their mother's surname, Fonseca. That's the bare bones genealogical uh, information. But their lives and what they made of their biology is buried deeper in dozens of other documents. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about them to give you a sense of the, of the great complexity of these conversos. Not long after Felipe's death, Gabriel fell in love with a woman named Blanca Rodriguez. There were two problems with her. One was she was uh, undoubtedly an old Christian, that is, not of Jewish descent. And the second was she was married. Uh, <laughs> to get Blanca away, away from her husband, Gabriel spirited her across the border to Spain. Blanca was pregnant with Julian. The other children squabbled over whether the father, uh, Julian's father was Gabriel or maybe Blanca's real husband. In 1534, Gabriel, Blanca, and three of the five children made their way to Sevilla, where Gabriel, after swearing falsely that he and Blanca were married, that is, to each other, and that no trace of Jewish or Moorish blood ran in his veins, was granted permission to sail to Mexico, which he did. Um, the, uh, Gabriel spent the remaining three decades of his life in Mexico, uh, first as a school teacher, then as a silver miner, and then as a magistrate. Blanca, who was not biologically Jewish, but who faithfully helped Gabriel maintain a Jewish home during all of that time, survived him by two years. Let's look at the next generation in the next slide, Gabriel's Mexican-born grandchildren. We'll start with Blanca's child. Her son, Julian, worked for a jeweler for a while, wandered the north, and eventually opened a small textile factory in Mexico City. The Inquisition documents show that he wavered between Judaism and Christianity, practicing one or the other, or both, with little enthusiasm. During those years, Julian, Julian sired two children by women who are unnamed in the records, and neither of the children is recorded as ever, as ever having participated in Judaizing activities. In 1577, Julian married an old Christian woman, Francisca Sar Sarfati, with whom he had four more children, and none of these six grandchildren, uh, six grandchildren of Gabriel de Castellanos was ever accused of Judaizing. Now let's look at Felipe's four kids. Tomás de Fonseca mined for a while with his father and then set off on his own, settling definitively as a silver miner in Talpujawa, high in the mountains of northern Michoacán. As a child, he had learned Spanish, Latin, and a little Hebrew. For his first 10 years in the mines, his Judaizing consisted of reading books of Jewish interest to himself. Later, during his visits to Mexico City, he Judaized with his friends. He never married, but he had a number of children. As a teenager, he sired Teodosio de Fonseca with an Indian woman near his father's mine in Chiautla. The other four, Beatriz, Lope, Ana, and Gabriel de Fonseca, he sired with an old Christian woman, Ana Jimenez, whom Tomas had met during his visits to Mexico City, but never married. Though he maintained contact with his children all his life, he never passed on any of his Jewish culture to any of them. Isabel, well, Isabel fell madly in love as a teenager with her first cousin, also a Fonseca. They couldn't marry, but they ran away together and produced two children, a boy and a girl. I've learned nothing about the girl, but the boy, Tomas de Fonseca Castellanos, came to Mexico and became a silver miner and a shopkeeper in Tasco. He Judaized knowledgeably and with enthusiasm until the Inquisition put an end to his life in 1601. He never married, 
but he sired three sons and a daughter with an unnamed woman or women in Mexico. He did not maintain contact with his children. I found no evidence that any of his four kids ever Judaized or were even aware of their Jewish family history. We ought to note that after uh, Isabel's cousin's death, Isabel married an old Christian uh, named Mendes and had a son with him, but neither Mendes nor their son seemed to have been aware of Isabel's Jewish background. Felipe's other daughter, Guillomar de Fonseca, married twice. The first time to an old Christian blacksmith, Antonio Perez Herrero, with whom she had three children. She kept her Jewish beliefs and practices completely secret from her husband and her children, sneaking off to celebrate the major Jewish holidays with her father's family. When Perez Herrero died and the three kids had become independent, Guillomar's father, Gabriel, who was well into his final illness then, wrote to his hometown friend, Cosme Pereira, who had lived for a time openly as a Jew in Ferrara, and then was working for the colonial government in Peru to come to Mexico to marry Guillomar, which he did. Guillomar and Cosme had no children together. Felipe's, Felipe's remaining son, Lope Teodoro de Fonseca, rejected the family's Jewish completely and overtly. He became a priest. The tally then of three generations of Lopez, uh, Lorenzo de Castellanos, fam the first three generations Judaized to, to various extents. But the fourth generation of Gabriel's, uh, 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 the uh, old Lorenzo's great grandchildren, uh, there were a total of uh, 16 fourth generation Converso great grandchildren, and only one of the 16 is known to have Judaized, Tomas de Fonseca. This is the other family, the children and grandchildren of Antonio Hernandez de Almeida. Felipa was from, uh, uh, both she and her husband were from the Portuguese city of Viseu, where Antonio was a second tier bureaucrat and later went to serve as the administrator of the castle in the border town of Almeida. They had six kids, two girls who died in infancy and are not on the chart, and four sons. Hector de Fonseca, surnamed for his mother, uh, Miguel and, Fernand, and Francisco Hernandez, surnamed for their father, and Jorge de Almeida, surnamed for the town where he was born. Antonio and Felipe were second generation conversos. <clears throat> they transmitted their Jewish knowledge and their commitment to their four kids. Now, when the Inquisition came to the Raya de Portugal, they all made choices to stay, to leave, where to go. Antonio and Felipe brought their oldest son, Hector, to Mexico. That is, they chose to remain in the Iberian cultural ambit rather than to seek out one of the well-known safe havens of Europe or the Turkish Empire. They may have thought the Americas to be relatively safe because there was no formal inquisition then. Their son Hector wandered the northern mining districts for a while and eventually settled in Tosco where he worked as a silver miner for the rest of his life. The younger kids <clears throat> decided to go to a safe haven. They all went to Ferrara. Uh, and they, they uh, made a living there for a while. Uh, the older one, uh, um, <clears throat> Jorge de Almeida became very rich and eventually married one of the Carvajal girls in Mexico. Uh, the other two, Francisco Hernandez became a small businessman and his brother uh, learned to become a drunkard. Uh, they too ended up in Mexico after a while. Uh, the interesting one is Jorge de Almeida. He, he married one of the Carvajal girls who was a, was a very fervent Judaizer. And although he had Judaized openly in Ferrara, he chose to reject that when he came to Mexico, and he would not permit his wife to Judaize in their house. And life in that family must have been hell. Eventually, he and his, uh, uh, a friend of his who married another of the, of the sisters, um, they, uh, the Inquisition came for the entire family. The friend escaped to China. 
Uh, Jorge escaped to, to uh, Madrid, and the two girls were arrested by the Inquisition and both of them executed. Uh, in other words, the Inquisition and do documents include a lot of inf uh, genealogical and biographical information, but surnames in and of themselves are absolutely useless because they were very unstable at the time and they changed lots and lots of, of groups of siblings had separate surnames. Uh, and very often the next generation had yet another set of surnames. So to try to trace yourself all the way back just using surnames is an enormous waste of time. It's inappropriate to assume that all converts were Anusim, or for that matter, that all conversos were Judaizers, or even some who were Anusim continued as Judaizers. Uh, you really have to go on a case-by-case -case basis. And by the fourth generation after conversion, the percentage of Judaizers fell off very, very rapidly. We'll let it go at that. I had more to say, but so be it. Thank you.